morning. I am Sheree Finney, if I haven't met you. That's who I am. Um, Brandy's running. She's, she's amazing. She's our tech gal. She prints your notes. She reformats them to look beautiful. She makes slideshows. I mean, if I could just hand this mic over. She's the best daughter. That's right. Well, I got two pretty good ones, but she's all right. Um, so, uh, Brandy is going to show you this crazy image we're going to open with. This is my living room window. Oh my gosh. The fur baby on the other side is my cat, Piper. And the reason I show you this image, as I was preparing this lecture, we were supposed to be doing this last Tuesday, uh, my cat, Piper, it was actually really early on a Sunday morning. This wasn't the day, this is just an example of what he did. I was typing out your notes, which you have, and when it's wet, windy, and cold, and it's blowing nasty storm outside, my cat suddenly jumps onto all of our screens oh. and hangs on for dear life to get our attention to let him in. So <laughs> this is what was happening so your notes and your little hands could occur. Piper was freezing outside and wanting to come in in a very subtle way. So that was just our, our laugh for the morning. So hopefully it won't be our last one as we get through this lesson. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna pray now and we'll get to lecture. Oh, Father God, you are so good, and we just commend this time to you, Lord. Um, this month is so busy. It's so rich and full in so many ways with friends and family, traditions and obligations. Um, but God, we don't want to miss the greatest gift. We don't want to miss the greatest light that has ever come into the world. We don't want to miss your presence. We don't want to miss any of it, God. So help us in our anticipation this month of your Savior, of your Son's birth, our Savior, Lord. Um, we just thank you. And we just ask that this time, right now, you would have the freedom, Holy Spirit, to come, help us to refocus and get our minds centered completely on you. Let us meditate on your word. Let us reflect on it as we leave from this building, God. Um, thank you for this opportunity, and please guide my words. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm thankful for the heat that keeps kicking on. Yes. Uh, that's a blessing. Um, so today I'm going to actually pull out, well, one, I'm also thankful this this time I have a voice. Last time I sounded like Kermit the Frog or something it's all croaky sounding. Um, so it's nice to have a voice and um, be able to speak without talking. Um, but this week I wanted to fall back in our lesson that you just went through in your groups, we talked about the fact when Jesus walks on water. But in John's account, it's not as, I'm not going to say it's complete, it's a little different than Matthew's account. So we're actually going to be stealing from Matthew a little bit in our material today, uh, but we're talking about the subject of faith. So I titled the lecture today, Lord Save Me from Little Faith. Lord Save Me from Little Faith. Um, I was looking at what Jesus had to say about the idea and the concept of little faith. And he uses the phrase in the New Testament. As far as I can tell, it was only Jesus using this term, little faith. And so it got me kind of like keying in each time I saw this phrase. Um, but each time Jesus used, this, used the phrase, little faith, it's actually as a rebuke to those he's speaking to for people failing, and here's your first blank, to hear his voice. Jesus uses the term little faith each time as a rebuke for people failing to hear his voice. There's not too many blanks to fill in this lecture, so rest easy, your carpal tunnel will back up on this one. Um, the term little faith in the Greek, um, I'm so glad you didn't make the number for it, but in my notes I had 3640 underlined, and I didn't want Brandy to translate that to fill in the blank, that's not really necessary. But the Greek term there, um, oligopistos, I'm not really great on the Greek here. Um, it describes someone dull to hearing the Lord's voice or disinterested in walking intimately with him. So when you look up the term little faith in the Greek in each of these uses, 
it's describing someone dull to hearing the Lord's voice or disinterested in walking intimately with him. Kind of a game changer when you look at what the term little faith means. In Matthew 6.30, I put it in your notes, um, the terms used, and, it, and will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Again, Jesus says it in Matthew 8, 24 to 26. Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Matthew 14, 31. O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And then Matthew 16, 8. I just love that idea when Jesus asks, Do you remember, my twelve, how I fed thousands from a few leftover loaves? O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? I emphasize the do you remember part on that. That's modern scripture, the bull. Um, but it made me think that the disciples, they literally were the ones collecting the leftover of the miracle. I mean, it's like you're literally like still holding the warm loaf. Do you remember, O oh, you of little faith? what I did, what I provided. So I just thought, it just made me think of, they actually, the disciples actually held the miracle with their hands. Do you remember, oh you little faith? I want to look back now at Peter, um, not the book of Peter, the person, and I want to read Matthew 14, 22 to 33 to you. So we're going to look back on Matthew's account of when Jesus walks on the water. John's is super short of Jesus walking on the water, so we're gonna look at Matthew's account to expound on this. So Matthew chapter 14, 22 to 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of them to the other side. While he sent the crowds away, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when he, it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my spot. Um, they were terrified of him and said, it is a ghost. I still lost my breath. <laughs> I should get bigger. Thank you. Um, okay. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. And he said to him, and he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. Looking at this passage, and I have in your notes, little faith trusts enough to get out of the boat, but then rethinks the whole idea. Little faith trusts enough to get out of the boat, but then rethinks the whole idea. And I included in your notes, for example, my head nods in agreement that God is trustworthy, but sometimes my heart hesitates at his requests. I was thinking about Peter in the boat, and in my own thought process, this is just me thinking, had it been me in the boat, first off, I wouldn't have said, Jesus, why don't you call me out to you? That would have never crossed my mind. I would have nudged Linda to say, you should really try this here. And then if she stood upright, I might, 
them see, well, well, Bethany can step right too, and then Brandy, okay, then maybe finally I'll get out of the boat. But I would have been the worst candidate to be the one to like, oh, well, let's just see what happens. Like, should I get out of this boat? No, I would have literally been on the side of the boat, hugging my nose, bracing for impact, because I would not have had the faith to even suggest that Jesus call me out to him. Two, that the water would hold me if I was to get out. I would have preferred the part the sea method, where I like the dry land, and goodness knows these shoes shouldn't be on water. They're ridiculous. I wore ridiculous shoes today. Um, but then I would have also thought, like, as Peter, if I was in Peter's shoes, don't I get credit for at least, like, being the only one to try this? It's just, it's just so interesting, though, that little faith just rethinks the whole idea. We have the guts to kind of go for it, but then as soon as we get out of that boat, we're rethinking the whole thing. I put a quote in, um, that is always the trouble with weak faith. It comes back again to questions that it is already solved and answered. So can anyone, can anyone go there with me? It, or do we have any of those that um, have afterthoughts? After they, <laughs> Donnie's like, yeah, we have afterthoughts. We say we're going to do something for God, but then later we're like, yeah, what about this or that? We have afterthoughts. Um, I have a, a small little story for you. So last Thursday, I was at my kid's school, and I was chatting with the principal, and um, she mentioned there was kind of a predicament coming up that day, and she said, we actually had a mix-up on today's chapel schedule, and she accidentally wrote down the wrong date, and she assumed she would be speaking at chapel for the school the following week. The chapel coordinator assumed she was speaking that day, so there was a mix-up, and it was December 1st, and I said, oh, well, you should totally speak about Advent, and as soon as I opened my big mouth, she goes, would you like <laughs> and I was like, I, I literally, I opened my mouth. It was my fault that I said anything. And I literally had a Fiddler on the Roof moment. And what that means is, in the movie Fiddler on the Roof, time stands still, everyone freezes, and the main character has time to think about and thought process and dialogue his thoughts. And I literally, as she said, would you like to do it? I thought... No. <laughs> At first. But I literally felt the question inside. Do you trust me? And then I started thinking, well, do you love me? And I said, do you trust me? So the whole musical going on in my head. So then in that split second to give her an answer, I just said, fine. I, I'll do it. I had 15 minutes to prepare a 30-minute talk wow. for 7th through 12th graders. They are way more intimidating than you guys. <laughs> so 30 minutes to pre uh, 15 minutes to prepare a 30-minute talk. So I went, the, the church there has a cry room, and fittingly I went into the cry room, and I just said, Lord, I don't even have like loaves right now. Anything I'm prepared to offer you, and he said, I don't need the loaf. I created the loaves in that miracle. I just need you to be willing right now. So, in my spirit, the Lord's telling me, you must decrease, I must increase. So, the best preparation I could do was just fly on my face, pray, get her done. This is, Lord, you're going to have to work. But in that crisis, I thought, I mean, crisis in the, in the moment, it wasn't like a life-altering thing. It just made me think, I preach to others, God will provide for you every day. God is faithful. He's going to sustain you day by day. But in my process, did I actually believe that to live it out? So in the topic of little faith, yes, we claim and we say we believe, we say we have faith, but are we willing to act on it? Are we willing to step out of the boat and act on that? Um, Andrew Murray said something that I liked. And Andrew Murray said, absolute surrender 
asks the question, are you willing to surrender yourself absolutely into his hand? Do you not believe that he can keep you continually, day by day and moment by moment? So I was thinking about Peter in this account, and doesn't absolute surrender get out of the boat and then believe he can keep me in his hand? I'm getting out of the boat, but he's keeping me by his hand upright. Um, back to this. So I want us to think about what are your core convictions? Core convictions. I was reading something that was interesting to me, and it said, look at your daily actions. This will tell you about your faith, because they're very revealing. John Ortberg says, faith is coming to believe with my whole body what I say I believe with my mind. Faith is coming to believe with my whole body what I say I believe with my mind. I, I got this quote from his book. If you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. I bought, got the book because the title fascinated me. I mean, that was a great reason. And I, I, my son was looking at it, and I just said, oh, it says if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. And he goes, well, obviously. <laughs> obviously. What I say I believe what I think I believe and what I do really, or sorry, and what I believe, let me start this over. What I say I believe, what I think of I believe, and what I reveal I really do believe by my actions. So there's the saying what I believe, there's what I think I believe, and then there's what I reveal I really do believe by my actions. I wanna look at, um, Peter again. Peter makes a confession of Christ in Matthew 16, 16. But the same man denies him three times in Matthew 26. Peter makes that confession, you are the Christ. But the same man denies him three times. Um, I want to read Mark 14, 29, and 31. Sorry, I'm throwing a lot of numbers out at you. You don't have to write, write it down. It's also being recorded if you want. So I'm going to read to you Mark 14, 29. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, that this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. Verse 31, but Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. Maybe Peter had convictions, but it turns out they were fickle. Because once Peter's circumstances changed, he felt differently, and I can relate to that. Sorry, one moment. So, question, why did Peter walk on water? And I just love the simple answer to that, to go to Jesus. Why did Peter walk on water? To go to Jesus. I was reading in Matthew Henry's commentary, and he suggests two reasons. To know Christ's power, that's your blank. 2 Peter 1.16 says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Why did Christ call Peter out to know Christ's power, first of all? And second, so that Peter would know his own weakness. And that's back to John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. I think sometimes perhaps we might um, need to have our, by the Lord's power, him to increase our faith. And, and we need to de decrease reliance on our own strength and on our own power. So why did Peter doubt in this account when he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he looks um, at the wind? That word doubt, when he doubted, it's to waver, 
doubt or hesitate when Christ tell, tells him that. I believe Peter was walking on water because he had faith in Jesus' word, but then he began to sink as he saw the wind. So the elements around him produce those afterthoughts. Um, your next blank here, um, Peter lacked confidence in Christ. And perhaps Jesus was implying, oh, you have little faith in me. And that's just my take. Perhaps his lack of confidence in Christ when he takes his eyes off of the Savior in the storm was implying, oh, you have little faith in me. I think little faith gets out of the boat, but great faith follows Jesus wherever he may lead. It is hard to have faith in the midst of crisis. Um, I, this week, was with a uh, loved one who's in hospice right now, and I was thinking about all these things I know that I had just recently studied, and I was just thinking about faith in the midst of crisis is very difficult. Um, I know that um, the circumstances, as Peter got out of the boat, may not have changed instantly. The storm was still going, um, but the Savior was still present in the storm through that. And, and I think that that's where the process is. Uh, your next part. The Lord was growing Peter's little faith into great faith. It's the Lord's doing. I read a quote that I love, and it said, First the disciples had, the, had faith in Jesus, then they began to have the faith of Jesus. And I loved that thought. First they had faith in Jesus. Then they began to have the faith of Jesus. It was growing. It was being learned. Great faith is never blind faith. It sees the waves, feels the wind, hears the thunder, tastes the rain. But then great faith goes further and above all of this senses something more. Here's your blank. Great faith sees a savior. And that's a quote by Scott Hubbard. Great faith sees a savior. I know just from interacting with some of you in this room that you could be experiencing a storm right now, wave upon wave of trouble, as I put in your notes. Um, you might be in uncharted waters, as Peter was in our story. We do need to take time as we're doing now to refocus, to get our perspective, and to see our Savior in the storm, that he's present and he is with us. Um, and I think that's learned. We must learn to trust Jesus for our daily lives, for our next need, for our every um, circumstance. I want to read a story to you, and it's, it's from... Um, John Ortberg's book, Faith and Doubt. And um, it, it's on the lines of waiting requires patient trust. This story comes from Henry Nguyen, whose gift to the world was his struggle with pain and faith as the wounded healer. At, yeah. The final year of his life, he took a sabbatical from working and writing. Henry longed for God, yet found it hard to pray. He found himself drawn, go figure, to a circus act. A Dutch priest who had taught at Harvard and Yale was hanging out with the greatest show on earth. They were a trapeze act, the flying Broadleys. He watched them perform, and then he got to know them. Trapeze artists usually use a safety net nowadays, but even falling into one of those is dangerous and sometimes fatal. There were five members in the act, three flyers and two catchers. The flyer climbs the steps, mounts the platform, and grasps the trapeze. He leaps off the platform, swinging through the air. He uses his body for momentum, swinging with increasing speed and height. The catcher hangs from his knees on another trapeze with his hands free to reach out. The moment of truth comes when the flyer lets go. He sails into the air with no support, no connection to the earth. He does a somersault or two. Picture him in the middle of a somersault and freeze the frame. 
There is absolutely nothing at that moment to keep the flyer from plunging to his death. Bryn, can you pull up the image while I continue reading? Thank you. What do you think he feels like? Do you think he feels fully alive? Every cell in his body screaming out? Think he's feeling any fear right then? In the next moment, the catcher swings into our view. He has been timing his acts perfectly. He arrives just as the flyer loses momentum and is beginning to descend. His hands clasp the arms of the flyer. The flyer cannot see him. To the flyer, everything is a blur. But the flyer feels himself snatched out of the air. The catcher takes the flyer home. And the flyer is very, very glad. Now, Nguyen spent time getting to know the flyers. Flyers are small. They weigh about 150 pounds or less because if you're a catcher, you don't want a flyer with a sweet tooth. <laughs> he learned about the equipment they used. They had socks filled with magnesium, dry powder for their hands, especially for Joe because Joe was one of the catchers. They told Henry, Joe sweats a lot. If you're a flyer, you don't want a catcher with sweaty hands. Here's where the trusting comes in. Letting go is always an act of trust. Rodley, as the leader of the group was called, told Newman, as a flyer, I must have complete trust in my catcher. The public might think I'm the star of the trapeze, but the real star is Joe, my catcher. He has to be there for me with split-second precision and grab me out of the air as I come to him in the long jump. Nguyen asked him, how does it work? He answered, the secret is that the flyer does nothing. The catcher does everything. When I fly to Joe, I have simply to stretch out my arms and hands and wait. Henry asked him, you do nothing? A flyer must fly and a catcher must catch. The flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there waiting for him. The flyer must never try to catch the catcher, the, tra the trapeze artist told Nguyen. He must wait in absolute trust. The catcher will catch him, but he must wait. His job is not to flail about in anxiety. In fact, if he does, it could kill him. His job is to be still and wait. And to wait is the hardest work of all. You may be in that very vulnerable moment right now. You have to let go of what God has called you to let go of. But you can't feel God's other hand catching you yet. Will you wait in absolute trust? Will you be patient? Waiting requires patient trust. I love that imagery of the flyer must fly, the catcher must catch, and the complete surrender, trust, and waiting requires patient trust. So I have questions for you to reflect on. I only put one on your notes, but I thought of two more. You don't have to write it down, just think about them. Where do I need to be still and know he is God? It just made me think the flailing about in anxiety with our trapeze illustration could be deadly for them. But knowing in scripture when God says, be still and know that I am God, made me think about where do I need to be still right now in my life and know he is God and wait with patient trust. The blank that you have, the question to reflect on, what doubts send me sinking? I want you to reflect on that. Peter had doubts. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and looked at the wind, and his doubts sent him sinking. Know and understand what triggers you, what doubts are sending you sinking, perhaps in your faith, perhaps in your trust with the Lord. What can throw your relationship with the Lord in a tizzy and it just sends you sinking? My other question is, are you willing to risk absolute surrender? Are you willing to let go 
of that bar, absolutely <laughs> surrender to the plan of the Father and trust he is there to catch you in what he's calling you to do. I know for me, with the what doubts in me sinking, I know that my sinking produces me to cry out to Jesus. And the cry of, Lord, save me, please rescue me, but knowing that I can have such little faith at times, so Lord, save me from my little faith. And Jesus, with his, his calming words, it is I, do not be afraid. I wanted to close with Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I know it takes trust and um, letting go, but I know that I have a faithful Father and Savior, and that was my last point here on your notes, that someone far greater than the storm is here, so don't be afraid. Remember that God is displaying his power for you in the storm so that you and I can respond. Truly, you are the Son of God. I want to encourage you, no matter what um, circumstances you're facing, that he's present, he is with you, he is greater than this great storm that surrounds you, to be praying to him, for him to reveal by his spirit what doubts are sending you sinking and where your trust with the Father is lacking. My prayer for you is to have great faith um, and, and to literally get out of the boat he's calling you out of and to come to him. Let's pray. Father, you are good and nothing in us is good, Lord. The, the fact that you sent your Son and your Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to bring us back to you, God, after so much sin in my own life, uh, I just, I'm so thankful and humble just for that opportunity, Lord, to just live in freedom, knowing that you're there to catch me. I just pray that you would help us surrender and yield in absolute surrender, God, to you, knowing that you are good and that you are for us, God. Um, help us to live, Lord, lives that are pleasing unto you. Uh, encourage us through each other, and just let us not forget the hope of the gospel, Lord. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for being present within the storm. And we trust you, Jesus.